cordial welcome, dear listeners and spectators, to the first edition of the European Press Club since March this year. For well-known reasons, it's a video streaming, this edition, and we are very uh, happy that we have very experienced and competent panelists, Ilse Nagler and Katalina Hallmey. They will be with us for the next 45 to 50 minutes in order to have a closer look uh, and show the topics. Ilse Nagler is the correspondent of the Latin television broadcaster LTV. Back home, she has been well known already as a journalist and as the presenter of a prime time news program. And here, a woman who has been a journalist uh, for more than three decades, Katalina Heimer, and for some 20 years in Brussels already. Uh, she writes for the independent uh, Hungarian newspaper Nets Sava. And if these are not enough challenges for her, she is now the chairperson of uh, uh, the Association of the Foreign uh, Press Representatives. Uh, they represent their interests vis-à-vis -vis the European Union, Belgium and NATO. By the way, you have an opportunity to ask your questions via the hotline. Here's the telephone, uh, 032, if you are abroad, 472-030181. And if you're in Belgium, it's simply 0472-030181. And use the email, then it's streamline at lv Brussel dot hessen dot de and hessen i mentioned hessen in germany so that uh, is uh, a good way to give the floor to uh, the minister for federal and european affairs of the state of hessen lucia putrick Ladies and gentlemen, a cordial welcome here uh, to our Hessian representation to the EU in Brussels. Uh, the topic uh, is a hot autumn ahead for Europe. There are several topics lined up, and let's remember our last press club, very different topic. We looked back at 100 days of the new Commission. We reflected on what the Commission could uh, do and achieve. Now, our discussion has no lack of topics. A top topic will be COVID-19, of course. How can we tackle the challenges? How can we continue together on uh, a success uh, course? Um, what uh, will the monies be for and where do they come from? And that leads us to the MFF, the multi-annual financial framework, still to be adapted, still requiring a lot of discussions, but we need a solution. And uh, let's look at foreign policy uh, themes. One example, the Brexit continues to be top on the list. I'm so worried when I observe developments with the negotiations. The current state of play indicates that the relationship between Ireland and Northern Ireland uh, is reason to uh, be concerned. I hope that we can move on towards good results, but it will be an effort. And there are other foreign policy issues, the relationship with Russia, the EU vis-à-vis -vis Russia. We need here a sh joint commission. We need to speak with one voice vis-à-vis uh, -vis Russia. So I'm happy that the European Union as a whole has not accepted the election results from Belarus. It sent a clear signal. We do not accept uh, fraudulent election results or manipulated election results or election results that uh, just follow a certain spin in the interpretation as offered by the government in Belarus. That we and others uh, try to fight on behalf of democracy gaining the day there. 
And there are other uh, fields of action that need clarification, like our relationship with China or our relationship with the USA. What will be the result of the elections there? There is a plethora of topics we can discuss uh, in the context of the 14th Press Club. And certainly, we will also touch on the common asylum policy. We still face gigantic uh, challenges here. Over several years, unfortunately, we have not managed uh, to, to define one uh, pathway. And we were so uh, impacted by what we observed uh, in uh, when w watching the images of the living conditions in uh, the camps like Moria. It is our task to help people, to give them decent accommodation. And if people are entitled to, to enjoy uh, a stay uh, in the European Union, that we offer a new home to them. Together with you, I look forward to a highly interesting European Press Club. Once again, the leadership is in the hand of Michael Stabenow. For many years, he was the correspondent of uh, the daily Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung. Frau Ministerin, vielen Dank für Ihre Eingangsworte. Ich werde jetzt von unserer Muttersprache in die Sprache wechseln, die hier von allen eigentlich nur noch gesprochen wird. So, thanks very much for tuning in, uh, but you have an interpretation in, in German, which is uh, available. Um, Minister has mentioned plenty of subjects. Uh, there are more to mention. The conference uh, on the future of the European Union, which should come up at some stage. Brexit is a huge issue that will keep journalists busy over the coming weeks. And I'm sure how interesting it would be to uh, discuss this in detail. It uh, is probably not possible within the time allowed. Uh, I think it's very um, <coughs> interesting to have uh, two participants from uh, Central and Eastern Europe, from two member states that joined the European Union in 2004, and who sometimes can shed a different light uh, compared to what we as uh, people from the old member states, from Germany, Italy, or France, uh, and Benelux countries would normally do. Um, and because of uh, this meeting taking place between two uh, quite important meetings. Yesterday you had the meeting of foreign ministers and coming up now on Thursday and Friday you will have the European summit and the leaders will also have to keep themselves busy with the thorny issue of uh, relations with Belarus. As you know they, they couldn't agree yesterday so that's something that we will have to discuss. Uh, the meeting of uh, the leaders which will take place now uh, will be one where they will be present but who won't be present is Ilse and it's Katalin and hundreds of other journalists who won't be allowed in t and to just do their work as they are, they are used to. So before entering uh, into the subjects, I just wanted to know a bit on how actually you work on a day-to-day -day basis under the corona uh, pandemic conditions. Perhaps Ilse, how, how do you work? Uh, do you work from home? Or? I work from home and in that sense my, my, my work hasn't changed so much. But I think that there will be more and more challenges uh, for, for instance for television. Because um, when we do interviews with uh, commissioners or with uh, ministers, now we do it on the street in front of the commission or in front of the council. Uh, because we are not, journalists are not allowed to enter the commission or to enter the council. What's going to happen if it starts to rain or what are we going to do in the winter? Uh, where are we going to do our TV interviews? Because the ministers have time to run out uh, and do an on-camera interview for, for 10 minutes. They don't have time to go somewhere, sit in a studio. And not all countries, all TV stations can afford to, to have a studio in, in Brussels. So that's going to be a big challenge. So both as far as the practical organization is concerned of the work, but also probably the content. I mean, how do you get information? Is it more difficult now to get all the information to assemble Yeah, it's them? very difficult to get mm. uh, some uh, off-the-record information, background information, because now everything is mm. done only via uh, internet platforms, via Zoom or any or, or other other uh, platforms, but so it's for journalists. It's very important to talk actually to people to feel. Uh, and uh, for the off-the-record information, you have to have a personal contact. So the, I think that the quality of the information we can gather has decreased, and that is a big risk. That's probably a view that you would share. 
do you get a lot of uh, question complaints from members of uh, API and uh, how do you view the general working conditions for Brussels based correspondents these days Catalin Yes uh, and we receive uh, many complaints from colleagues and the complaints are are more or less similar the people are stuck at home and uh, Uh, the press rooms are not open uh, except for the European Parliament, so the journalists are not allowed to to go to the Commission or to the Council. Uh, as Ilse said, it is extremely difficult to reach out to people, to talk to them, to meet them, to to gather information. Uh, you cannot do that sitting at home and just making calls because people do not uh, uh, reply your calls. Uh, as API, uh, we try to to ensure that uh, all the main institutions uh, um, um, support uh, journalists and and guarantee the proper working conditions for them. It's not very easy uh, sometimes, but uh, API was quite successful vis-à-vis -vis the Commission and the Council uh, press services and in this respect. Uh, since this is uh, <coughs> transmitted to a largely German-speaking audience, how do you view uh, the practical operational performance of the German presidency? Is that uh, satisfactory? or? Um, so we, we are in the middle of the German presidency, so I don't want to make an assessment about it. Uh, the German presidency also experiences that these are not normal times, so we are in a learning process, they are in a learning process, we are in a learning process, of course. Um, the main problem was so far that uh, in, in the press conferences in, in, in Germany, after the informal ministerials, uh, Brussels-based correspondents uh, were not allowed to ask uh, questions online. So they had to uh, send an email and uh, wait uh, whether, whether the, the spokesperson will read uh, this or that email or not. So mm -hmm. this is one of the uh, problems uh, we experience here. Yeah, so that's again talking about practical uh, problems. As far as the content goes, of course, the German presidency has to uh, deal a lot with the major issues coming up, like uh, asylum policy. There will be uh, proposals coming forward tomorrow by the European Commission. Uh, certainly in London they think the German presidency will have a crucial role in trying to unblock uh, Brexit uh, negotiations. Uh, you, you have a, a lot of issues. The conference on the future of Europe was mentioned. Uh, unfortunately we cannot go into really much of the detail there, but perhaps do you have an assessment of uh, the performance of the German presidency so far in the wake of the challenges? It's, it's not an easy time to have a presidency and as Catalina mentioned uh, that that it's a virtual presidency, basically, especially for the media, mm -hmm. uh, and that has made it uh, made it more, more difficult. Um, I think out of the current situation, they are sort of trying to to do most of it, but of course, like uh, there are shortcomings, of course, as well. Yeah, sure. Well, we should perhaps turn to Belarus. Someone who was present and uh, saw journalist was uh, Svetlana Dienoskova. Uh, the opposition presidential uh, candidate who lives uh, in the neighboring country now had to uh, seek uh, refuge or she had to move to Lithuania. Uh, yesterday, uh, foreign ministers didn't manage uh, to agree on a list of people uh, to be sanctioned. Uh, uh, it was interesting uh, to see uh, again how um, the uh, candidate positioned herself uh, and that's I think something that you might perhaps uh, help us to, to understand because she, she quite clearly said we expect the European Union to act and not to recognize uh, the, the frauds that were committed in the results and support uh, the, the democratic movement but she also I think she again didn't uh, shed a doubt on the question that uh, this was not about uh, being pro-EU or anti-Russian. And I think, historically speaking, for a country like Latvia, also Hungary, the European Union was something which allowed you to emancipate yourself from the dominance of the non-Soviet Union. So have you got an explanation as a neighbor of Belarus? And, and, and in that Latvia? sense, we, we, we are in a different situation because, mm. for instance, Latvia very clearly in the beginning indicated uh, that we see ourselves uh, together with Europe. Uh, at this point, but, but that's very understandable. Uh, Belarusians are very careful. Opposition is very careful. 
and, and also Svetlana Tikhanovska stressed yesterday over and over again that this is an eternal struggle, it's an eternal thing that they need to, need to solve and uh, they need European support but she's very careful what she's asking for. For instance, she wants uh, EU countries to step up with the sanctions uh, but then she's very careful that, for instance, the, the financing that the EU promised that there will be 53 million that mm -hmm. going into Belarusia and 50 million of those will go to support uh, uh, COVID victims, that that does not go uh, to, to, the, to support Lukashenko regime. Because yesterday what they said is that they have calculated that Lukashenko has money for another six to eight weeks mm -hmm to pay salary to their Oman, to their riot police, to their uh, power vertical. So what happens afterwards if he doesn't get money from outside? Uh, and uh, Belarusians are very, the, the opposition is very careful that the, the money that comes in from Europe doesn't go to, to, look, to support mm -hmm. Lukashenko regime. And also, for instance, if Europe wants to support independent media, um, how it can be done in a way that those media still are independent and don't start to look pro-European. So that is a very, very tricky uh, question. I yesterday also talked to our Minister of Foreign Affairs who, yes. uh, mm -hmm. and he said that the, the, the money uh, for, that has been assigned for Belarus has not been paid yet. So they're still looking for the ways how that can be transformed directly to the hospitals or how the media could be supported so it doesn't endanger the independence of the Belarusian opposition. Yes. But now, in the last couple of weeks, things have shifted. I mean, the response of uh, the authorities has been really very sharp. Um, Lukashenko went to visit Putin. There is clearly Russian involvement, so uh, the situation has already uh, changed. And how is that being viewed? I mean, it's traditionally, a country like Latvia, they know also about Russian activities, hybrid activities and so forth. Is there a sense that, that things are changing, that Russia is, is trying to interfere more and more? Well, that is always a, f a fear in, uh, in the Baltic states mm. because we have seen it happening and Ukrainians have seen it, it happening. So, uh, But uh, for instance, uh, uh, Svetlana Tikhanovsky yesterday said that they don't actually see that Russians could intervene by military means. Mm. So um, that's a good question. Was that a kind of rhetoric to calm things mm -hmm. down, not to provoke things? Or they actually see that uh, Russia is, it would not be beneficial for Russia to intervene in that specific case. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I, I probably would also stress that it was a sad thing to see that, uh, and that, that was what uh, Timofey, uh, uh, she stressed as well, Tikhanovska, that uh, EU member states could not uh, agree, uh, could not sign the start of the uh, sanctions, mm -hmm. and not because uh, they disagree on the sanctions, because, but because Cyprus took everybody as a hostage. Yeah, I mean, that's perhaps something that you could also reply as someone who actually also lived in Hungary when uh, the political situation was, was very different, and uh, of course, uh, being so close or much closer to Moscow than we are in Brussels, there are uh, different feelings about it, but what impression does it give then when a country like Cyprus, perhaps for good reasons, I mean the Turkish drilling activities in the eastern Mediterranean is able to block something on which they themselves agree, as you've just stated rightly. So what, what does that mean for the credibility of uh, Europe, certainly with regard to what is happening in a country like Belarus? Yes, that, that gives a very bad impression, I think, because the two things are separate and you cannot link them. So it's an artificial linkage, if you wish, uh, when Cyprus comes up with, with such a request. Uh, uh, and this is the reason why many politicians, uh, the Commission President uh, lately, uh, proposed uh, the qualified majority voting uh, uh, in foreign affairs. Because we have seen uh, the last couple of months and years that um, a member state or a group of member states can can stop the decision making, uh, and uh, this is uh, this is uh, what is uh, what hurts uh, the credibility of the European Union, indeed. Yes, but on the other hand, uh, it's very difficult to change the rules, even the possibilities that are in the treaty to go move from unanimity to qualified majority voting in certain areas, like foreign policy they are not, not really very much exploited. So what's, what's the prospect of, of really changing things? It's a 
perhaps, or probably a very good demand, but uh, is it realistic? Uh, there, there are two things, uh, to my opinion. One is the future the conference of future of Europe that you mentioned. That uh, mm. the, the conference on, on the future of Europe might discuss the treaty change, and with the treaty change might come uh, the qualified majority voting uh, in foreign affairs. On the other hand, there is a Commission proposal uh, from last year um, uh, to to switch uh, in some in some uh, fields uh, in the foreign policy to switch to the qualified majority voting. Uh, it seems to me that the legal service uh, has found some uh, possibilities uh, for this. So let's, let's see uh, what happens. Yeah. And I think it also will be interesting to see uh, how this decision to, to, to block uh, sanctions now will backfire on Cyprus itself. Because uh, what you, you could see also from the ministers who came out from the council yesterday, a lot of them were angry at the Cyprus position. So will that actually help Cyprus or Cyprus has sort of pushed themselves sort of up in the tree and now they will have a hard time to kind yeah. of what, get what down will from there? What happened then on Thursday and Friday? I mean, it's difficult to predict, but the, from what you sense, is there more chance that I, I think that there is be because if the prime ministers cannot solve it uh, Thursday or Friday, mm -hmm. then who can? Yes. But mm -hmm. there has been some indications that uh, sort of France is stepping up uh, and sort of mm -hmm. discussing it with uh, with Cyprus that uh, that might that on on Thursday and Friday on the European Council they might actually finally sort of give the green light to sanctions against uh, the Russian regime. Yeah. But it means that this subject will, so to say, be hijacked again by, by an issue that should have been solved uh, a very long time ago. True. Mm -hmm. And it's still a discussion if Lukashenko will be included in the list of people who yes. are sanctioned, mm -hmm. because there are member states who support that, uh, including Baltic states, and there are some member states who oppose it. And then let's see how it's going to work out. Hungary, what's their position? Uh, we do not know the Hungarian position on that. Okay. Uh, the Hungarian uh, foreign minister, and it is very telling, after uh, yesterday's Foreign Affairs Council meeting uh, held, uh, not held a press conference, he, he made a statement on his Facebook page, and he just mentioned uh, Belarus, um, um, saying that uh, we asked, Hungary asked uh, the high representative to help um, uh, the, the bishop of Minsk to return. Mm -hmm. That was all what okay. he said about the whole Belarus issue. Yeah, that's interesting. That is very telling. Yeah. Well, you remember that uh, already in August there was a special summit meeting and before that there were the foreign ministers discussing and announcing that they would uh, come up with a list of people that were, would be, uh, uh, have, have be sanctioned and we're still waiting for it. We'll be waiting a long time also for qualified majority voting, I think, uh, in spite of the uh, treaty possibilities of the so-called passerelle, which mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. alluded to. But uh, we'll, I think we move a bit further to what's actually happening here. I mean, we've touched uh, upon Belarus, uh, where uh, one country is blocking everything. Um, I'm turning now to a subject where two or three, let's see, four people, uh, four countries, member states might block something, and that's an issue which is hotly discussed, namely the multi-annual uh, financial framework uh, for the European Union and the big recovery package which was decided in the wake of the corona crisis. Um, this is ongoing. We'll see whether member states and parliament will be able to agree. At the end, they will have to. There's no other possibility, but the question is who will give in. Any ideas on that? <laughs> it's, it's very difficult to, uh, to, to judge and uh, to say what will happen, because um, in the situation where we are now, everybody tries to, to um, balance its position, um, vis-à-vis uh, -vis the others and uh, uh, try to push uh, national interest or other uh, things. Um, when it comes to veto, uh, we've heard uh, only about Hungary and Poland. Um, these two countries are threatening to veto uh, the multi-annual financial framework and also the recovery package uh, because of the rule of law conditionality or better, they, they don't say that they will veto, they say that we want to see first 
What conditionality would the European Union like to impose on member states? And then we will decide what to do. But it's a very complicated package uh, with different interests are coming together. So it's, it's very early to say whether Hungary or Poland or any other country will, will succeed. And they're not uh, directly threatening with blocking it, but uh, they're going around the corner by talking about the own resources uh, yes. issue, putting that forward. So it's a strategy where they just don't say we don't, don't agree with it, full stop, but they come up with certain conditions which make things uh, more and more, uh, probably more difficult to understand what yeah, it's all about. Yes, because this own resources decision uh, has to be ratified not only mm. by the European Parliament and, and uh, adopted by the Council, but also by the national parliaments. Mm. And th this is, this is uh, the situation where the member states have a say, uh, two times have a say in yeah. the Council and also, also uh, during the ratification uh, at home. So we touched upon this uh, thorny issue of rule of law. To what extent is it uh, an issue in the Baltic countries or in Latvia? No, we don't really see an, an issue there. But uh, as I see that there will the, the MFF is not of the, not out of the woods yet, yeah. because also Parliament has raised its uh, yes. objections, and they also always have asked for more money. Now it's most specifically for the e common EU projects, including Rasmus research. Uh, so and I think that they're also struggling with uh, how this uh, mechanism for the rule of law is, is set up. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, that's another sort of, there is a one fight, as, as Catalina mentioned, within the sort of council, within the, uh, among the member states, and the other one is uh, with, with the parliament. Yeah. Now I'll have to switch subjects because you gave me a term which brings me to this uh, little card where I have a question from the audience. Peter H. Niederels. Was wird getan, um die Mittelkürzung für das europäische Forschungsrahmenprogramm zu verhindern? Did you understand what I nope. say? Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> what about uh, the problems that we really related to, to research? Uh, what, what is being done in the framework of discussions to um, not to cut, or to prevent cuts in, in uh, the common uh, framework? Of what research? should be done? Well, any, any views? Is it being cut I down? I mean, you, you, you can take a very sort of straightforward approach, just give more money and then there will be no cuts. But member states are not willing to increase uh, increase the, the, the budgets. Already this was a, a, a tough fight. Mm -hmm. And actually it's interesting because this commission got much more money to, to work with than any previous commission thanks to the recovery fund. Uh, but yeah, so uh, repli replying to that question, just uh, paying more money and it will all be fine. Is that an answer? Is it very doable? Good, no? Very good, very <laughs> good. We know as journalists uh, the problem is always that you, you ask questions and you cannot only expect uh, replies, but if a journalist replies to a journalist question, that's already <laughs> a great success. You mentioned the um, rule of law issue, which is not uh, a major issue. Um, another one which is a major issue in relation to Hungary and Poland is asylum and migration. Mm -hmm. And uh, Germany, of course, is very itchy. And uh, some of us uh, were in Bratislava four years ago, the informal summit meeting, where there was this notion, you know, on the distribution, mandatory quotas for the distribution of refugees, uh, that this might be solved because countries like Hungary, Poland, uh, flat out uh, refuse to take uh, any refugees. Um, the, the idea of a flexible um, solidarity which already made us smile. Now there's a new term that was introduced by uh, the Commission and uh, will be, I think, part of the proposals. It's mandatory solidarity. And the idea is that uh, everybody has to show solidarity, but solidarity can be shown in different ways by either taking um, refugees in, like uh, the ones from Moria now, the camp in Greece, where Germany has decided to take in 1,500, around 1,500 migrants, uh, but also, um, well, other, other uh, solidarity uh, which is expressed by providing um, uh, troops for the, the guard coast or uh, helping just in terms of logistics, 
Um, to me, it sounds a bit like flexible solidarity four years ago, but there's uh, another mm -hmm. term, but perhaps I, mm -hmm. I'm not right into it. But what, what do you make of this idea, Catalin? Yes, uh, so the Commission uh, will uh, adopt the migration package tomorrow. It will be a huge package, that is what we know at this moment. Uh, not many details uh, have been leaked from this uh, migration package, but we, we know some of them how the Commission tries to, to solve this, this deadlock, which we have been since 2015. Mm -hmm. um, we know that the Commission wants uh, um, the European Union to be tougher. Uh, it wants to uh, strengthen uh, the external borders. It wants to, uh, to uh, ensure that those who are uh, illegally uh, in the European Union, those who are uh, staying uh, in the European Union illegally returned. Uh, and there is some sort of uh, mandatory solidarity also. Uh, what I've seen lately is that there will be a sort of mandatory relocation also, which I honestly, I didn't expect after the, the, the many years of, of uh, heavy debates between the member states uh, about this. Um, we will see what is in the, in the uh, proposal tomorrow. I am quite sure that if there is any mandatory solidarity, whatever it is, uh, Hungary uh, will not like it. Others won't like it, but uh, countries like Hungary and Poland will certainly refuse to take in any refugees. Yes, uh, the, the problem is that uh, the Hungary's problem is not only with the relocation. What, whatever uh, the Commission or the European Union proposes, Hungary is against because Hungary is against the migration as such. Mm -hmm. So uh, no matter how much money will you pay for Hungary to accept refugees, they won't accept it because they are against, in principle, the migration. Viktor Orban, the Prime Minister, says that we don't want migrants in our country, full stop. So that is uh, a principled opinion. It's not about money, you know, it's not about uh, uh, European legislation. It's, it's, it's a principle that they, they are against the whole, whole phenomenon of migration. So while we're talking about mandatory solidarity, uh, and you even talk about the possibility of mandatory quotas. It's not realistic to expect that. So the countries that uh, insist that every country takes in migrants, they, they will have to compromise if you want to have finally after five years a way out. Is there any idea how to solve this from a, a country that I think you, uh, in Latvia don't have that many refugees. I think some went to uh, Latvia and then immediately yes, went on we, to other countries. Yes, in the first countries. in the first wave, we, yeah. we took in some 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 yeah. some, some some migrants, and yeah. uh, they're on a way. Mm -hmm. uh, they, yeah. the, if they wanted to go to Germany, they just uh, mm -hmm. even if we took them in, mm -hmm. uh, they just uh, migrated further to, to to Germany because mm -hmm. in Latvia, either it's too cold or they received too. too and not enough money, mm -hmm. so they didn't want to stay. But it's very hard to imagine that it didn't fly first time, this, uh, this uh, mandatory solidarity. And mm -hmm. wh why would it fly now? Uh, I mean, Poland, Hungary, also Czech Republic didn't take mm -hmm. in, uh, migrants in when they were supposed to. They didn't fill their quotas. I don't really see that things have changed uh, now, and they will certainly agree with that. Mm -hmm. And also what we have seen, I mean, look at the uh, Cyprus example, more and more countries decide that they can, uh, they can veto, they, can, uh, they don't want to go for a compromise. Even though in this commission's proposal, it seems that uh, uh, EU is willing to pay 10,000 euro for each migrant you take in. Mm -hmm. That's a mm -hmm. lot of money. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's also, I think, a question for internal politics in some countries. If the politicians have been in, e elected on the premise that uh, no migrants will arrive, then uh, it's very difficult to change yeah. now. And we see that in a lot of uh, also Eastern European countries, uh, the, it's, it's, it's right-wing right governments. It's going to be very difficult for of them to change the, the, the position. But the view in Riga is uh, quite different compared to what Visegrad countries would say on this. They would be rather closer to 
the position of um, Western or Central European member I states? I think it's very difficult to to draw sort of uh, to, to draw parallels mm -hmm. in, in this case. We are much much more pragmatic. Mm -hmm. We don't take such an aggressive uh, sort of uh, position. First time we, we took uh, uh, the number of, of migrants that we, we were asked to take in, we did take them in, uh, but there was a lot of uh, internal opposition to that as well. So that's, that's a, it's politically, internally very difficult question in, in those countries. Mm -hmm. And it's of course an issue for the country where I come from. Um, do you have an idea how the German presidency might tackle this? Uh, Will they be more ready to compromise? That's my impression, my hunch. I think that the German presidency will try hard uh, to, to arrive at a common position, but I do not expect that any agreement is possible during the German presidency. Mm -hmm. um, and even I, I heard this from German diplomats yes. saying that they, even they do not expect that this issue uh, could be solved until December this year. So I think that uh, we will have very controversial discussions again about this issue. Yeah. Of course, uh, for the moment, the number of refugees is low, but it's increasing again. And since you mentioned the role of Cyprus, uh, and it also, of course, raises the issue of, of Turkey. Uh, how do you see uh, the relation uh, of the EU with regards to Ankara and the uh, agreement of 2016, which is still working more or less, and uh, which meant that uh, the EU pays a lot of money, but uh, it's a price for not having millions of refugees coming in from that country. Is there any risk that you think that uh, figures might surge again? refugees and this might of course also have an impact on the discussions yes. on the reform package. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well I mean for Turkey it's 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 a kind of a, a good card to play. They always can threaten with uh, opening up their borders and uh, uh, but uh, you has always stressed that those are two different issues the illegal drilling and the, the, the uh, agreement on, on on migration that's those are two different things. Uh, but yeah, Turkey is becoming more and more assertive in the region and we have seen it uh, now for a couple of years already. Uh, and that is a challenge, how to, how to make relationship. And I mean, that's a neighboring region, so yeah. how to yeah. build a good relationship in spite of everything that's going on and how to balance out the tensions. And uh, of course, not all the EU member states have the same line. I mean, if you look now at Cyprus, the uh, position of France and the position of Germany, which normally is very much aligned, is not, not, not really uh, totally identical, which uh, of course raises other uh, probabilities of, of, of problems. Well, Turkey is a big issue that we could go on discussing. Uh, perhaps uh, looking on the watch, we can just perhaps uh, touch upon the issue of Brexit. Uh, any views? Uh, will it be the hard Brexit that uh, has been talked a lot about? Or do you see still a possibility that a compromise might be reached in the last minute? So before the end of October, I know Boris Johnson has said a settlement must be reached by the 15th of October. There's also a deadline by the European Commission with the legal procedures uh, that, that would run and from the end of September. So any views on that? Um. On the basis of past experience, I expect a deal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no matter how absurd mm. that sounds uh, at this moment, because I think that, that both parties uh, have uh, very, very strong interest to, to reach a deal. Otherwise, we will be in a, in a awkward situation. Um, although I have to add that uh, before the Brexit uh, vote in the UK, I also said that the UK won't uh, vote <laughs> for leaving the European yeah. Union. They cannot uh, be so crazy. So it might be this time I am wrong, but uh, I expect a deal at the last minute, in the last minute, yes. I, I would like to agree with you, but I would still put my five euros that uh, there will be hard Brexit. Mm -hmm. Because as, as you mentioned, you're right. We didn't expect the Brexit votes to go that way as it did. So it just shows that politics are not always about uh, rational thinking and, uh, mm -hmm. and, and pragmatism. Sometimes it's purely emotional. And here, I mean, the, the relationship between the EU and, and, and Great Britain has deteriorated over the couple of last weeks. 
can they manage to, to sort of save it? And uh, Boris Johnson said that they have to agree by the mid-October. Well, that's within the less than a month. Mm -hmm. Can they do that in order to ratify it? So my five euros goes for the hard <laughs> Brexit. Yeah. Not more though, not okay. more, just five euros. <laughs> <laughs> and would you put more than five euros on an agreement? No, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, I mean, if I can say that from my own opinion, is that normally when there's a major crisis in Europe, you have the impression there's some choreography which is uh, mm -hmm. being dealt with uh, somewhere backstage and that in the end somehow it uh, will work out. I mean, that's how it actually happened with the withdrawal agreement about a year ago. But here you have the impression that uh, uh, there's a dynamic that has been created that is very, very difficult uh, to control. But perhaps to put both positions together, I think you might not exclude a, an agreement which then in the end would come down to the same as having a hard Brexit but it wouldn't be called that way, so some sort of an agreement. But that's something we will see uh, over the, the next uh, coming weeks. Something which we've seen for the past weeks is that there's a new European Commissioner responsible for trade. Uh, Phil Hogan, the Irish Commissioner, had to step down because he took part in a huge golf dinner on the west coast of uh, Ireland and uh, in the end, he had to step down. The pressure was too big from his domestic, from the domestic front. And people were wondering whether it would be another Irish uh, commissioner uh, for, on, on the post of trade. And here we are, someone uh, came up uh, who's always there somehow when their post to take up. It's uh, Aldis Dombrovskis, the uh, first executive, uh, the first executive, one of the executive vice presidents of the European Commissioner Commission, who's been in Brussels uh, since uh, 2014 and he already took over um, the financial services issue under the last commission when there was a problem. So we should have thought about it that he would be the best choice. Now, uh, I mean, I've seen him. Um, my impression is that he's someone who's very knowledgeable, who's very experienced, but he, he doesn't seem to change. Even his face is always the same. Have you ever seen him crying? Uh, uh, in the official situations, I have seen him laughing once and close to tears once when he announced that he will be resigning as a Prime Minister of Latvia. I was a journalist uh, back then in Latvia. But, I mean, he's a technocrat. He's, uh, he's always very knowledgeable. Can you remind us why he stepped down? I think that he was stepped down a good, uh, very good as a reason. Prime Minister of Latvia because there was a big explosion uh, in a supermarket. The, the roof collapsed and a lot of people got killed. So he took a political sort of uh, responsibility for that, and that's why he resigned. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, he's always knowledgeable, and uh, yes, he ha always has a poker face. So that's, uh, uh, but uh, yeah, it's it, that's a good question. Is that a sort of uh, will be good for the trade negotiations or or not? He's a different uh, type of negotiators than uh, than Hogan, Phil Hogan, I would assume. Uh, but uh, trade portfolio is, is very important now, taking into account that uh, you need to, to work on the relationship with China, um, mm -hmm. Brexit is, is, is there, uh, so uh, US uh, trade negotiations, so that's a very important uh, portfolio. And how would you characterize him? I mean, uh, he has a poker face, but on the other hand, is someone who really knows all the files very well, he was well prepared, has strategic thinking also. He's always very well prepared. You cannot get him on numbers. So he always, I mean, even if you prepare so well, he will always, you know, you cannot get him on numbers or on sort of, uh, uh, on, on details. So he's, in that sense, he's, he's very, uh, very knowledgeable. Yep. And what does it mean uh, for his position in Latvia? I mean, he stepped down, he moved to Brussels. Is he very visible back home? He's quite visible back at home. Uh, before COVID, he was, uh, once in a while, he was also uh, appearing on, on Latvian media. He was uh, traveling home as well. Uh, but, I mean, it's, uh, Latvia doesn't directly benefit, you know, from, from yes. what he's doing here in Brussels. Mm -hmm. Now he's, uh, he's responsibility for financial stability, uh, uh, for the um, financial services and capital markets are going to another commissioner. What's probably of interest to, to Latvia and Baltics is that he's no more responsible to look after the sanctions that he was before, mm -hmm. but he will be uh, still, 
uh, still looking after the financial and macro macroeconomic help to mm -hmm. Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So that's those are two important topics in Latvia, and that's uh, so sanctions are not his responsibility anymore, but uh, help to Ukraine is. No. But he's of course someone who, uh, coming from that region, who has an eye on the neighbors, on the situation in Belarus, and certainly also on what is happening in Moscow. Is he? And what's his experience with uh, dealing with uh, Putin? And uh, I don't. Yeah. I'm not sure if has been dealing with Putin. I mean, when he right. was a prime minister mm. of of Latvia, I don't really think that uh, we had a official visits back uh, back then. But. Uh, well, out of all the, all the other possibilities, mm. other, other commissioners, he seemed to be a very natural choice in terms mm -hmm. of the knowledge, experience, and also the political affiliation. Mm -hmm. So, and we're gonna, we're gonna see what's, uh, what the MEP is gonna ask him. The hearing is on the 2nd of October, right. and mm -hmm. I think the vote is on the 7th of October mm -hmm. in the parliament. Well, uh, European Commissioner is, of course, uh, not a mandatory of uh, national governments or member states. He's uh, sworn in on uh, the terms of European Commissioners, and that's why perhaps I ask you how you view the, the performance of uh, the Hungarian Commissioner Vaheli uh, over the past year. I think uh, uh, Oliver Varhey uh, lived mm. up to the expectations, so he is very much focusing on his portfolio tries to not to interfere in the affairs of Hungary, um, except for the first few months when he put some controversial tweets on his Twitter account. He retweeted um, tweets of, of um, right-wing, uh, uh, far-right yes. mm -hmm. um, Italian politicians. Then I think uh, the commission president or somebody else told him not to do that. So since then, he has been focusing only on his portfolio, which is the Eastern Partnership and the Western mm -hmm. Balkans, enlargement. Uh, he is a technocrat. He knows his portfolio very well and um, traveling a lot uh, in mm -hmm. the region as, as, as far as I see it. So he is not exposing himself as a politician. He tries to remain a bureaucrat, so to speak. Okay. so. Because there were some fears, of course. Exactly. He was very outspoken as a diplomat compared to other um, permanent representatives. I don't know about uh, the Latvian permanent representatives, whether they are so outspoken, but he was one of the really outspoken people. But he was then the representative yes, of Hungary. Yes, he Hungarian was the permanent representative government. of Hungary, yeah, and yeah. he defended mm. uh, the Hungarian position in mm. every issue. That was his job, of yeah. course, but he was. Uh, insisting yeah. on this uh, very much. Well, since we are talking about Hungary and uh, I mean, you're, you're working for an opposition a newspaper, there are a lot of discussions and also uh, there are um, pro uh, problems with relation to uh, the, the European Union with regard also to, to media, uh, press freedom. Um, I, I saw an article uh, that was published by another independent media, there are not so many left, uh, of course, uh, Direct 36, which uh, made an investigative uh, inquiry on relations between Germany and Hungary, German business especially. Yes. And although I knew that uh, German companies are very, very successful and very much present, especially car manufacturers, uh, Mercedes, BMW and Audi, um, that uh, here in this article they, they claim that uh, the economic interests are so strong and Orban used to respond to that and, and really be very forthcoming also with state aid matters, which in the end meant that uh, even within political circus, uh, circles, uh, while not always agreeing with Orban from a German point of view, uh, the situation wouldn't be made so so difficult. Uh, there are exceptions. I think telecom companies from yes. Germany had problems. Yes, one or two banks. Companies and but they, in the article, had the impression that uh, automotive industry, because it, if you look at them and their suppliers, they made up uh, ten percent of Hungarian GDP. Almost with the sub suppliers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Suppliers. Sub -suppliers. It's a very important sector, and it's uh, very largely, of course, linked to. Uh, German uh, industry is that. Uh, uh, do you think it's a fair assessment to, to say that uh, Germany or German companies, especially business, but also uh, 
government uh, parties, especially the Christian Democrats, uh, are pretty soft in the end on, on uh, Orban? Yes, I think it is. Uh -huh. uh, this, this, this relationship was widely rumored uh, before in Hungary, but I think this article is a proof of that, although uh, the reporter uh, quotes uh, uh, anonymous sources because mm -hmm. many people didn't want to uh, to, to use uh, his or her name uh, when, when talking about this uh, uh, special relationship between uh, the German industry and the Hungarian political circles, Hungarian government uh, and Fidesz party. And I see um, that uh, in the EPP, the European People's Party, the Fidesz is suspended, but uh, the things are not moving. And one of uh, the reasons of this, uh, uh, the CDU CSU position, um, as we've seen in this uh, article, is that these parties are um, divided mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to to Fidesz and and, and Mr. Orban performance. Um, so yes, uh, I think there is a, a strong, decisive influence. Um, from the German industry side uh, which, to the Hungarian and government. Which is um, supported by the government or part of the government because I think the foreign minister Heiko Maas is quite critical also European affairs minister Michael Roth when it comes to migration rule of law issues he's very sharp and also relations between Angela Merkel and uh, Viktor Orban are not that easy as I understand. No, but this, the, the article says that it's a pragmatic relationship. Mm. So mm. They do, it says that they, they need each, each other. Mm. And by the way, when, when you mentioned the, the foreign ministry, so this is not the foreign ministry, if I am not mistaken, which, which um, um, has a big influence on, on the policy of the chancellor on Hungary. Um, so yes. the foreign ministry has not a big say uh, how to um, uh, create this relation, how to develop uh, this relationship between Germany and Hungary. Yeah. Well, we'll see that, but it's of course a, a large coalition partner. Uh, you mentioned Fidesz in the European People's Party. Um, what do you reckon will, will happen with, with this issue? I mean, it's been dragging on for nearly two years now, I think, or one and a half years yes. uh, that Fidesz has been suspended, three wise men led by Hermann van Rompuy, they, they stopped the, the, the work. Uh, um, Donald Tusk, the um, chairman of the EPP, seems to be very forthcoming. Um, he wants them out. But do you see that happening? No, no, I... Both of, you, both of you. <laughs> I think that it can drag uh, on for another year or so, but uh, you raised a question about the German uh, business and yes. politics. And I think there is another interesting case to watch out now, and it's Nord Stream 2, because in the case was Navalny poisoning, uh, the, the parliament has issued a strong declaration asking for international and transparent investigation. Now, European Council tomorrow most likely going to do a strong statement on Navalny's poisoning as well. The question is, and also Ursula von der Leyen mentioned that yes. in her speech, mm -hmm. but she just mentioned the mm -hmm. gas pipeline without any details and we just can guess how this current uh, case with Navalny's poisoning will affect the uh, uh, future of Nord Stream 2. Certainly there are um, new elements in the discussion in Germany because until a couple of weeks ago it was quite clear cut not everybody had the same position as uh, Gerhard Schröder the former chancellor but overall uh, there was an agreement that this project should go ahead now something you can see is that, that people are, are very, very doubtful. I mean, Hungary is also uh, a country that, as far as energy supplies come, is heavily dependent yes, on, on Russia. On Russia exactly. So what do they see? How do they see the Nord Stream uh, 2 They are not project? very enthusiastic about the mm. Nord Stream. There is another stream, the Turkish stream, yeah. mm. that Hungary is, is keen to, to join, uh, this Nord, uh, Turkish stream. But when it comes to the Nord Stream 2, um, we are together with other Eastern European countries uh, in opposing that. Mm -hmm. Turning back to Fidesz, I mean, you uh, replied uh, <laughs> more or less uh, yes. that it will it drag on. It can drag on, I think, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 so uh, Donald Tusk is an outspoken critic of Fidesz and uh, or Viktor Orban's policies. Mm -hmm. um, he wanted to, take, to, to put this issue 
on the agenda of the political assembly this September. But since we live uh, pandemic times mm -hmm. and um, uh, the parties um, cannot be physically present, so he had to delay the vote. Uh, whether to continue the suspension of Fidesz, whether to expel Fidesz or whether to restore the membership of Fidesz. And I think it's a good thing that he delayed this decision because there is no u unity mm -hmm. at all in the EPP uh, when it comes to Fidesz membership. Not only the CDU CSU is divided, which is very important, one of mm. the most or, or the most important member party of EPP, but also other other parties. So um, yes, it will it will drag on, and and um, we have to wait months and months uh, yeah. what will happen. Yeah, yeah. Ilse, you mentioned uh, Ursula von der Leyen with relation to not mentioning Nord Stream, but probably alluding to hinting uh, to hinting. the gas pipeline. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, you've listened to her speech last week. Um, how do you, both of you, how do you see her performance in the first 10 months now that she's been uh, in power um, compared to Juncker, perhaps, if you can make a comparison? Uh, she was someone, I mean, she became commission president, but uh, she was not on everyone's wish list, certainly mm. not on the CSU mm. wish mm. list, because Manfred Weber, the chairman of the EPP, is a CSU member. But in the end, he, he didn't make it. So uh, it was a bit by surprise. Everybody was surprised, I think, including herself. Uh, but now she's there. So 10 months on, what do you make of her performance? I think it has been a very difficult time for her to, 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 to start the commission. I mean, with the COVID crisis, every commission, of course, uh, commission president is blessed with crisis. Would it be migration crisis, Greek crisis now with, with, with COVID? It has been very difficult times uh, for her to start. Um, I think she's, uh, as, I mean, she's a different person from Juncker. And uh, I think she's, she's doing quite well. And I think that the fact that she has a background of a doctor has helped in this specific situation as well um, and uh, yeah and as I, as I mentioned before she has been giving much more money to to kind of to spend to work with than any other commission president before thanks to the COVID as well so she has been it was a very difficult beginning uh, but she has got more opportunities now than, for instance, Juncker had. The question mm -hmm. is how she will use those opportunities. Yeah, I, I think the, the biggest achievement, uh, no doubt, is this recovery um, uh, facility or a fund, uh, 750 billion, which is a huge amount of money. And, and I think it is one of her achievements. So, so, sh so she put uh, political capital on um, uh, arriving at uh, this agreement in the European Council. Uh, she is a much, much better communicator than President Juncker, um, I think. In what way? Uh, the, uh, she, she is very pragmatic, she mm -hmm. is very concrete, um, she speaks, she speaks better, um, so she, um, she, she communicates better than, than, than President Juncker, and she is very pragmatic. What I um, don't like, and that is policy, that I don't see that she is very strong on the rule of law. Mm -hmm. We discussed mm -hmm. this issue before. Um, I expected her to be a little bit harsher and uh, protecting and defending the rule of law issues uh, a little bit stronger than, than we've seen so far. So was it the same as on Nord Stream that she hinted only at what should happen rather than just saying clearly and loudly this is something we cannot accept? Probably it's the same. She has to be very, very careful. Yeah, we'll see. Job, Wait job. and see uh, if uh, things go as expected. There's another four years ahead for her, and who knows, uh, even more. For us, it's nearly over now. Uh, looking at the watch, um, coming close now to um, two o'clock. Um, I will talk in German. Uh, I can translate it to you afterwards if you need it. Herzlichen Dank, Katalin, Ilse, 
Das hat großen Spaß gemacht. Das war mal eine etwas andere äh, Sichtweise. Because äh, it um, glaube, provided all of us a slightly different uh, angle and viewpoint. And haben. I hope and trust that you who have uh, been following this exchange share this view. We have an EU with 27 different uh, member states and different viewpoints. So, uh, it's natural and. Uh, Katalin Halmay uh, expressed uh, it very well. Also, Ilse Nagle back home as an investigative journalist uh, knew what it was to also have enemies. Our next uh, event here is on the 13th of October at uh, uh, one o'clock. Uh, we have here a discourse on Europe with Professor Dr. Joachim Würmeling. Uh, he knows uh, Brussels very well, he is now in the banking world, and I think the topic fits. The impact of Corona. Is Europe facing a new banking crisis? If you are interested in knowing more, then join us on the 13th of October. I thank you very much for your kind attention, and I hope you have uh, a wonderful day ahead.